Hello, my name is Stephen Dunn. I'm the author and creator of Hellenistic Christendom, and you've made it to the first video of my sort of, I guess, series of videos in a lecture series that I'm be doing about the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. So specifically, aside from my writing, I just recently wanted to start creating some different content for YouTube to kind of expand the page and offer more engaging approaches to the ideas that I'm writing about. Now, of these ideas, I thought here I would offer my contribution to the Kierkegaard world by offering a sort of presentation, which I'll hope to attempt to make as brief as possible with each video, uh, lucid and engaging as possible for a general audience, though certainly an audience that is comfortable with stretching their brains for a short time. Now, nevertheless, my reason for making this presentation in the first place is to bring a rather underappreciated Christian intellectual back into the limelight with respect to with what I think anyway, is Kierkegaard's intellectually robust view of God and the human individual, all the while maintaining that, or what such a view means for the uh, particularly modern mind. Now, to start off the first video in this series, I'd like to highlight two important reminders with respect to my treatment of the material that is to follow. The first is that Soren Kierkegaard is somewhat of an elusive thinker, by which I mean that in the expansive contents of his work, the true test of his genius, so to speak, has typically been measured in that the future expositors of Kierkegaard will have much to wrestle with regarding what precisely he meant in this or that passage, or what was his view on the subject, was there ever even a view presented, and so on and so forth. So. That's one issue. The second important highlight is a kind of extension of the first, and it's because of his use of the pseudonymous authors for a fair portion of his earlier published works, such as Johannes Climacus in his postscript, Anticlimacus in his Sickness unto Death, or Johannes de Salentio in his Fear and Trembling. So these authors will present perspectives and arguments which are not necessarily Kierkegaard's own view, especially mentioning that the authors themselves will often present arguments which run contrary to, the, uh, to other authors. So Soren Kierkegaard clarifies for us, however, a section entitled First and Last Declaration in his book Concluding Unscientific Postscript to Philosophical Fragments, or just postscript for short. He writes, quote, My wish, my prayer, if it might occur to anyone to quote a particular saying from the books, he would do me the favor to cite the name of the respective pseudonymous author. From the beginning, I perceived very clearly and do still perceive that my personal reality is an embarrassment which the pseudonyms with pathetic self-assertion wish to be rid of, the sooner the better. So furthermore, he says, quote, Thus, in the pseudonymous books, there is not a single word by me, end quote. Now I'll come to explain a little bit better Kierkegaard's use of the, of the pseudonyms in following videos, um, but with respect to actual treatments of Kierkegaard's written work, development of thought, and etc., every interpreter must make uh, a sort of mental note of this hermeneutical sort of point, so to speak. So the question I'd like to address in this video, and it'll kind of get into the next section as well, is why Kierkegaard? So to start, I first want to address the important question, why seriously study Soren Kierkegaard? And I'm sure there's some of us watching this video who have viewed or perhaps currently view Kierkegaard as an irrationalist, an anti-irrationalist, or a fideist, a subjectivist, or an existentialist, the father of modern existentialism, as we're often told, a critical theorist, a postmodernist, a modernist, uh, so on and so forth. Now, my personal answer to the question, why study Kierkegaard, is in part um, that he fits all of these molds and simultaneously, uh, simultaneously none of them. Kierkegaard is really the kind of thinker that has erected a system, air quote, with which to comprehensively understand his work and is yet simultaneously an anti-systematic thinker. Now, this isn't to point out an inconsistently on Kierkegaard's part, but only to highlight the crucial tools of irony, humor, and dialectics that he so regularly uses throughout his writing. Much like how we understand poetry to sometimes be descriptions of fiction, Kierkegaard explored what it meant to be a fiction. Hence, Kierkegaard will pick up and explore ideas that are not necessarily his own, as attested by his use of the pseudonymous authors to assist him in those areas. So then, on his birthday in uh, on May 5th, 1843, he made the following remarks in his journal. Quote, After my death, no one will find in my papers, this is my comfort, a single explanation of what it was that really filled my life. The select writing in my innermost parts, which explains everything and often transforms what the world would call bagatelles into events of prodigious importance for me, which I too regard as insignificant apart from the secret gloss which explained them. 
maybe I was saying that word right, word wrong because I never heard of it when I quoted it. So I actually had that starred and I forgot to look it up. But bagatelles, B A G A T E L L E S. Anyway, um, moving on. My final reason for why study Kierkegaard is, of course, because I think it's fun. True admirers of Kierkegaard know very well that he really is just the gift that keeps on giving. Not only with respect to the amount of books that he's published to keep readers busy, but that there are also his journals and papers, which contain an absolutely brilliant compendium of notes, reflective insights, draft clippings, uh, which were omitted from previous essays, books, and then some throughout his entire life. And if this weren't enough, there's also the fantastic conclusion of Bruce Kermes' book, which needs to be mentioned for all Kierkegaard lovers who aren't aware of it, his book called Encounters with Kierkegaard that he wrote in 1996, which contains dozens of contemporary accounts, exchanges with Kierkegaard, which are oftentimes absolutely hilarious uh, and even more insightful into who Kierkegaard was and how he was um, perceived publicly. Now, to get into the next section of this video, which is who is this video for? I'd like to have just some passing thoughts here. Although this is uh, a series which attempts to explain the thought of Soren Kierkegaard, a part of this explanation will nonetheless fit within the interpretive context that I've provided alongside him. Now, while I would certainly agree that Kierkegaard has earned himself a rightful seat at the table of historical philosophy, there is a profound sense in which I would emphasize his religiosity, that is, his Christianity, and his use of indirectly communicating that to his readers. So, therefore, I will be stressing that Kierkegaard was, above all, a religious thinker and considered himself as such. However, why this is important to point out is because there are maybe instances right now of non-believers, non-Christians, non-religious or what have you, who are looking into the subjects and ideas associated with Kierkegaard. Now this very activity of looking in is something Kierkegaard would have had his reader examine more closely, specifically that the matters of religion, whether God exists, whether hope is available in this life or the next and etc., are not merely a looking into sort of matter. As if one were a detective following up on leads, to, uh, leads towards solving a case. For even when the case is solved, the detective still goes home at the end of the day only to wait for the next assignment. So to hijack a Kierkegaardian understanding of this analogy, imagine being given a case you could never solve, you had to solve only this case, and even worse, you could never make progress towards completing it. This very situation of the human experience is why Kierkegaard persists an epistemic humility with respect to religious questions that needs to be breathed into fresh 20th century lungs, Christians and non-Christians alike. So, okay, I'll stop kind of here and kind of let this be the first video to introduce the series. I think the next couple of videos will be by way of biographical introduction, where I'll talk a little bit about Kierkegaard's upbringing, maybe talk a little bit about his father and perhaps Regine Olson, and then finally get into sort of the crux of his thought with later videos. But essentially, I just wanted to talk about sort of my announcement sort of for the lecture series I have coming up as well as what this video is for and what to expect out of it and specifically what audience is going to be receiving the kind of material I'm putting out there because I think Kierkegaard is such a thinker that is um, very insightful of course for Christians but there's a word I'm looking for here where he, he's a he's almost like a retriever so to speak he goes back into Christendom and tries to be a missionary to modern Christians so as to bring them back out of their sort of complacent religiosity. So that's very important on the one hand for the, the religious minded, but also for the non-Christians as well. Pagans, atheists, agnostic, agnostic, what have you. I think we have a better sense of Kierkegaard not so much trying to offer reasons or proofs to come to a knowledge of God's existence, but a kind of experience, experiential awareness, a kind of actualization of one's spiritual or moral developments. And it really is a robust sort of clarification that needs to take place in our treatment of natural theology and of really our religious life in general. So that's kind of my purpose for doing this lecture series and trying to bring Kierkegaard into a more general and a more sociable audience, especially within the Christian sphere. Of course, non-Christians are welcome as well, and you are always welcome. But of course, I, there seems to be a different reception uh, among believers and unbelievers as to their reading of Kierkegaard. So hopefully I can do a kind of holistic sort of bringing together. So yeah, that's my um, introduction to this series. I hope you enjoy. Please follow my page at WordPress and Facebook if you haven't already, and including YouTube, if you haven't subscribed to that and liked the videos and all that stuff. So thank you so much, and God bless, and I hope to see you in the next videos to come. Have a good night or good day, whichever it is. <laughs> God bless you.